welcome. Welcome to our discussion on weathering. I thought it was a little bit of a break uh, to uh, have uh, my daughter play a little fiddle music as opposed to you listening to my banjo music. So it was a little bit of an Irish jig for you. So today's discussion um, involves weathering processes. So we've looked at uh, minerals, we've looked at rocks, and now we're going to look at uh, weathering processes that act on the rocks. I like this discussion in this chapter because it um, allows uh, folks uh, studying earth science to see some of the features. And so these features are easily uh, detectable and seen on the surface of the earth. So today's discussion, we'll look at some erosional processes. Um, we're going to uh, venture in and take a look at uh, soils. So I got about four or five slides uh, that I will show you that will encompass an entire bachelor's degree in soil science. And then uh, we'll look at another process known as mass wasting. And mass wasting typically are responsible for earth movements and earth slides, uh, anything that gravity can have effect on. So that's kind of where we're headed uh, with this um, uh, particular discussion. So let's start by um, looking at some terms that we can use uh, to describe weathering. And weathering really um, is the physical and chemical breakdown of rock. And really what the earth wants to do is constantly for 24 seven, it has various processes that act physically and chemically to break down rock. So envision a huge boulder uh, being exposed to the earth's surface and over geologic time, this um, boulder is slowly uh, disintegrated, uh, slowly broken down into smaller pieces. And that's really what weathering does. And so this boulder then would be exposed to wind, water, ice, living organisms. And this boulder goes, you know, is exposed to these types of processes. And we always like to use the term 24 seven, never quits. So once material is broken down into smaller pieces through weathering processes, it now produces another type of product we term as regolith. And regolith represents loose or broken down rock layers. So it's really similar to what we talked about in our last discussion when we looked at uh, unconsolidated sediment or loose or broken rock layers. And so regolith is, is analogous to unconsolidated type sediment. And if you think about it, weathering takes place over the Earth's surface 24 seven. So it'd be very reasonable that regolith covers most of the Earth's surface. So for example, when you walk out onto the San Joaquin Valley, uh, right out from class um, or your house in this case, uh, and you kick a little dirt, you're probably more than likely kicking regolith. So what separates the earth then from other planets in our solar system is the fact that we have a hydrologic cycle and from the hydrologic cycle, uh, we can now take this regolith and convert it into soil. And soil typically represents the uppermost layer of the uh, um, earth's lithosphere, um, which, you know, again, as we know, soil is very important because it supports life. And that, again, that is a distinguishing characteristic, again, that separates the um, earth from other planets in our solar system. So let's look at a couple of major type processes that um, act on rocks, or for that fact, acts on anything. Anything that's exposed to the Earth's surface for a, a length of time is going to react to weathering processes. So in this particular slide, I have a statement that says, do things last forever? Consider that thought. If you've ever had some experience putting something out in the open air and coming back a few days later or weeks or so forth, um, it's changed. It's either been disintegrated physically or changed chemically. So really things don't last forever on the earth's surface. It's constantly being weathered and eroded. So for example, in my slide, I just to kind of re-illustrate and, and, and push this thought here, you see a nice brand new uh, concrete uh, driveway built on the house. And if that concrete wasn't maintained for various lengths of time, what would you think would happen to the concrete? Well, probably over X amount of years, you can see this picture. Uh, certainly the concrete is going to break up, crack, uh, disintegrate into smaller pieces and so forth. Again, nothing lasts forever. How about this? Here's a, here's a picture of a brand new 1955 Chevrolet hardtop Bel Air. 
And, you know, if I were to purchase this car in 1955, but never drive it and allow it to sit in my driveway, but never do anything with it, what would you think is going to happen to it over time? Well, it would probably look something like this. And again, weathering would uh, take over and slowly disintegrate the car, even though you don't drive it. And then if it looks like this, this older 55 Chevy hardtop, you may have to call this person out. Yes, you can chuckle. So this is the little tow truck tow mater. And then, of course, you'd have to call that truck and take it. So again, this is just a little slide that kind of um, enforces the thought and philosophy behind weathering that it happens 24-7, never quits. So rocks um, are either broken down into smaller pieces physically or rocks can be uh, weathered and uh, chemically altered uh, on the Earth's surface. So we need to get a couple of very important definitions down regarding the difference between mechanical and chemical type weathering. So mechanical weathering is basically rocks are, um, are physically uh, broken down into, into um, smaller and smaller pieces uh, from surface processes. And the key to the definition behind mechanical weathering is that the physical properties or the chemistry of the rock in this case does not change. So for example, you take a huge piece of granite and you allow this granite to be disintegrated over time through mechanical weathering processes. And basically you come back uh, over a certain amount of geologic time and now that granite is just a pile of smaller pieces of granite. And so it did not physically change and the chemi chemical, the minerals that make up the granite still remain the same. So that would be considered mechanical weathering. Chemical weathering, on the other hand, is exactly what it sounds like. And that is the rocks are now um, um, influenced by weathering processes. But in this case, the chemical makeup of the particular rock, the composition of the rock, uh, changes into a new type of rock or a new form which really defines the definition of chemistry. And that is you take one substance and the substance reacts with other substance and creates a brand new product. And so that would be, um, again, uh, taking a piece of granite, believe it or not, and allowing chemical uh, reactions to take place with this granite. And it actually can be reduced down to a clay. So think about that, a big hard rock like granite being reduced down to something that's been chemically altered into a clay. So it's important here in this lecture to, to really hammer down uh, the difference between mechanical weathering and chemical weathering. So I'm going to go through the next several slides and I'm going to show you some examples of mechanical weathering and then we'll show you some examples of chemical weathering. So with mechanical weathering then and the breaking down of the rocks, nature uh, is pretty smart. Nature um, wants to be able to expose more surface area so that chemical weathering can do its job because I kind of outline mechanical and chemical weathering as two separate type processes. when in fact on earth uh, mother nature didn't read the book and chemical and um, mechanical weathering both act simultaneously. So in nature um, rocks are broken down into smaller pieces to show more surface area and that again exacerbates and accelerates chemical weathering to allow it to do its job. So let me show you an example of what we mean by exposing more surface area. So we take this particular rock in your screen, you can see a uh, yellow rock. And for, um, for clarification purposes, then if you look at my arrow, the surface area of this rock is any surface of this rock being exposed to weathering. So the question is, how do we expose more surface area? Well, how about breaking the rock in pieces? So now if you look at the screen, I've uh, broken down the rock into four individual pieces, and you can certainly see that now we've exposed more surface area just by breaking this rock down and showing the internal parts of the rock. Now, how would I even break it down to show even more surface area? How about breaking the rock further into smaller and smaller pieces? And you can see at your right-hand side of the screen that now this particular rock is uh, smaller pieces and showing more surface area. And so really then breaking down the rock uh, moves from less surface area to more surface area, 
which now you have increased mechanical weathering, breaking it down to smaller pieces, which is now going to accelerate the chemical weathering component of, of weathering. So in the next several slides, that's what we're going to kind of show you. We're going to show you uh, how mechanical weathering breaks it to smaller pieces and that allows chemical weathering to do its job. So the first um, um, common uh, dominant uh, type of uh, mechanical weathering is a process known as frost wedging. And if you look at this particular slide here, uh, you see where rocks have been cracked. And you can envision that when moisture or water gets into the cracks and the temperatures drop below freezing, what's gonna happen to that water? That water basically is going to freeze and ice has a tendency to expand 9% of its volume, meaning that if you put uh, water into a, a cup, for example, and you <coughs> allow this cup to freeze in the freezer, uh, the ice will expand 9% of its volume. And what do you think is going to happen to the cup? The cup will break. In fact, I experienced uh, this process when I was a um, little kid. My mom had some expensive uh, china that my dad brought over from the Korean War. And I actually took one of her china cups and I put water in it and I put it in our freezer. And the next day the cup was broken and I suffered the consequences. I was actually given a spanking. That's what we did in my day. So if you envision frost wedging processes, if you envision frost wedging processes uh, on Earth, uh, rock is continually broken down over geologic time because of repeated cycles of freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing. And then this is a great mechanical way for Earth uh, to break uh, rocks into smaller pieces. Um, this is very, very common in uh, Yosemite. And so if you ever get a chance to um, um, go to Yosemite, uh, you'll see some huge rock formations, one in particular called Half Dome. And the reason why it's Half Dome because half of it's been broken off through geologic time uh, through frost wedging processes. Another problem where frost wedging is starting to um, get people's attention is Mount Rushmore. And so if you remember, uh, Mount Rushmore is a um, sculptured uh, um, series of, I think there's four presidents that are sculptured in Mount Rushmore. Um, I think it's in North Dakota. Uh, up in the areas in which you have repeated cycles of freezing and thawing. Well, today, at this point, believe it or not, President Lincoln's nose is just about ready to fall off because of frost wedging processes. Can you imagine taking your family uh, to Mount Rushmore and everybody's watching and looking at the four presidents and all of a sudden Lincoln's nose just falls off? Um, that'd be pretty traumatic for the, for the kiddos. Probably have to take them to counseling. So that's a major problem that's happening in Mount Rushmore. So what um, rangers and what uh, folks are trying to do is during the summertime uh, when they um, um, see cracks developing in, in the, the sculptures of Mount Rushmore, they try to uh, seal the cracks uh, with sealant to try and keep the water out. But my question for you folks, uh, given what you just learned so far about weathering, who's gonna win? Is humans gonna win? And keep uh, and keep the um, four presidents um, pristine, or is weathering going to win over geologic time? And probably the answer to that is someday weathering is going to win. And I would venture to say in the next hundred years, uh, there probably won't be a Mount Rushmore anymore. But instead, it'll be crumbled body parts uh, at the bottom of the ravine. Here's a, a slide uh, here showing. Uh, what frost wedging looks like. And so you can see where the granite has been broken up into smaller pieces and kind of giving a slivery uh, type look. This is a classic uh, feature uh, produced by frost wedging. This picture more, more than likely was taken up in the high Sierras where you get the repeated thawing and freezing um, cycles. So frost wedging, and you can look up here, rocks are broken into smaller pieces. The next type of mechanical weathering process is another very common process um, that uh, is viewed and observed up in especially the Sierra Nevada mountains. And this process is known as exfoliation or sometimes referred to as unloading. So exfoliation and unloading uh, are the same process. And rather than me read through each one of the bullet points, 
I would rather talk about the diagrams on your left-hand side and paraphrase the bullet points. So as I kind of move through this discussion of this part of the slide, follow along uh, with the bullet points. So exfoliation is very common uh, along granitic uh, type rocks, intrusives, if you will, intrusive igneous rocks. And so the first thing you have to think about is where do intrusive rocks commonly form? Well, hopefully you've learned from the last discussion that intrusive rocks form in uh, where magma solidifies below the Earth's surface. So if magma is solidifying below the Earth's surface, that's where granitic rocks are originating. And so they're happy there. They're happy with the overlying uh, weight of the rocks above them. Well, over geologic time, um, the granitic plutons or intrusive igneous bodies are slowly lifted up to the surface, thereby allowing the overlying rocks to be stripped away. So in this upper photograph, you're seeing where the granite's being lifted up and all the overlying rocks have been stripped away. And so now the granite is exposed to the um, atmosphere. And so the granite will actually begin to expand. And so once that overlying weight of rocks is lifted off of the granite, it begins to expand, or we can use a term, it begins to exfoliate. And once it begins to exfoliate, it begins to crack. And then the upper part of the granite uh, sheets of big granite slabs begin to slide down the side of the, the granite hill or the mountain in this case. And if you look at the lower photo here, you can see where the cracks have developed and these cracks are eventually are going to turn into sheets of granite that uh, move under the influence of gravity and slide down um, the, um, the, the limbs, if you will, or the mountain part of the granite. This is very dominant uh, weathering force uh, in Yosemite. And again, once those cracks develop, you can also throw in some frost dredging in there. And so again, through frost dredging and exfoliation, uh, you can certainly uh, start breaking rocks into smaller pieces. So your job for exam purposes is to make sure that you can distinguish and differentiate between exfoliation processes and frost wedging processes. And this picture here in this next slide shows an actual exfoliation dome. And there's a lot of areas within the Sierra Nevada mountain range in which you see these granitic domes, or in this case, exfoliation domes. And kind of take a look at this um, slide and see where you can uh, envision or see uh, uh, various sheets of granite that are actually sliding down the hill. So in the lower left part of your diagram, uh, you should see where the granite's been broken up into these little smaller sheets. In the upper right-hand part of your um, diagram, you can see some huge sheets of granites that are sliding down the side of the mountain. And so literally, when you drive into a canyon, especially areas of the Sierra Nevadas, and you see a sign that says falling rock, they're not kidding because some of these sheets, you know, weigh twice as much as a car. And can you imagine one of these uh, exfoliated sheets sliding down uh, the granitic dome and, uh, you know, crushing whatever it gets in its way. These uh, red arrows I put on the slide just kind of shows you the sheets that are kind of moving down the side of the exfoliation dome. The third type of mechanical weathering, so we've looked at frost wedging, we've looked at um, exfoliation, and probably a very common third type of mechanical weathering process is biological activity. And here is where rocks are broken down, um, either from animal burrowing, humans. I mean, we are a big part of uh, breaking down rocks into smaller pieces, uh, plant roots. And so these are all biological type activities uh, that can, uh, that can uh, mechanically weather and break down rocks. So here in this picture on your left-hand side, you see um, animal burrowing, you can see where the animals got in there and dug around and breaking down rocks. Here's human intervention. So in a lot of cases, you know, humans will make trails and, and uh, dune buggies and, and motorcycle trails and so forth. And that's a, that's a way in which uh, humans can intervene and, uh, and uh, break rocks into smaller pieces. Uh, later on, we'll look at what water can do to an area in which humans have, have kind of stripped away 
the vegetation and 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 uh, you know made little roads and trails. The lower photo you see here where it says plant root weathering. Here you can see where roots now have uh, um, got in between solid rock. In this case, it looks like a piece of granite, and the growth of the root has actually expanded and actually breaks the rock apart. And so uh, root um, erosion and root weathering is very common, especially if you go down to older neighborhoods in, in various cities. And so some cities in which they got big, older trees and older houses, and you take a walk down the curb, sometimes you see the curb buckled up and, and so forth. And that could be directly related to uh, roots. Uh, so roots uh, can certainly uh, make problems for people and hopefully you get to the root of things. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about chemical weathering. Because remember, mechanical weathering, the rock is broken down and does not physically change the rock uh, and does not uh, change the chemistry. But we know that chemical weathering, rocks are chemically altered. And we're going to now look at rock and we're going to chemically alter this rock and we're going to produce a new compound. And so the question is, if you look at the PowerPoint slide, why would a perfectly good rock I want to change its appearance. And really the key word behind this is that pink word on your slide, and that would be stability. And that is uh, rocks uh, on the Earth's surface, most rocks and minerals on the Earth's surface uh, are not stable. In other words, chemically, um, they really don't care for the surroundings. Um, the minerals that make up most of the rocks don't like the conditions on the surface. And so what is the natural response to that is that the rocks and the minerals will change um, will, will, will change to reflect whatever condition they're in. And so if we're under uh, certain pressures and temperatures on the surface, then the rock will change slowly and chemically and most likely uh, to reflect those uh, conditions. And so we're going to uh, take a look at one rock in particular, and uh, we're going to take a look at a rock and how water um, is a huge chemical agent that affects the chemistry of the rock. So if you look at the top of the slide, the question says, what common agent uh, can begin the process of chemical alteration? And believe it or not, it's water. And water is known as the universal solvent. And if you look at the universal solvent, you notice that water is H2O. Well, if you, if folks, for folks who've had chemistry, if you think about the uh, chemical nomenclature H2O uh, and you uh, think about acids, you find that hydrogen is the typical ion uh, that's always in the front of any kind of acid. So you've got, H, you've got the, uh, HCl, that's hydrochloric acid. You have H2SO4, that would be sulfuric acid. HNO3, which I believe is nitric acid, and look at water, H2O. So really, water is a form of acid. Fortunately, um, it's not as caustic and the hydrogen atoms aren't as active uh, in water, so we therefore can drink it and we need it. But for rocks and allowing water to react with uh, minerals and chemistry in a, in a rock, um, water can do a lot of chemical alteration. But nature helps water a little bit and can speed up the action of water by just simply by just simply adding a little carbon dioxide to the water <coughs> pardon me so if you look on your powerpoint slide you see uh, rain which is h2o and we have natural carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so we look at uh, rain water plus uh, natural carbon dioxide and add those two together and the atmosphere can produce a natural acid called carbonic acid, H2CO3. So it's a weak acid, but slightly stronger than water. And so think about over geologic time, then allowing carbonic acid, in this case, naturally produced and made in the atmosphere, to now rain on rocks and come in contact with some of the minerals on rocks. And then we can now begin to chemically alter and decompose from a chemical point of view, rocks into a different and new product. And so in this example, uh, we're going to take some granite, all right? And we're gonna choose granite because granite represents the most abundant continental rock on earth. And we're gonna weather that granite with some natural carbonic acid. And in particular, 
we're going to take one particular common mineral that makes up the granite, and that would be the potassium feldspar mineral or orthoclase, which is just a pink mineral uh, that's made up of potassium, aluminum, and of course it has its silicate tetrahedron. And so we're going to allow carbonic acid and rain to attack the orthoclase. And I want you to watch what happens to the granite when over geologic time, we allow this chemical reaction to take place. And there's the chemical reaction. And it looks pretty big, but it's really not. So let's kind of run through this chemical reaction. So we have an arrow right here. And on this side of the arrow, we call that the reactants. And then on this side of the arrow, this is the product. So when we study chemistry, we're always going to react something. And then on the other side of the arrow, we're going to produce a product. So in this case, we're going to react orthoclase. So here is the common mineral that makes up orthoclase, and that's potassium, aluminum, silicate. We're going to add some carbonic acid, and that's going to come from the rain uh, that's, that's pouring down on the granite. And we're going to throw a little extra water in there to facilitate the uh, reaction. So on this side of the arrow, what happens over time is uh, the potassium feldspar or the orthoclase now converts and decomposes to what we call a kaolinite clay. So it's kaolinite and the clay is right here, which is what we call an aluminum silicate mineral. And so really, if you look at this reaction then, what happened to the um, potassium? And you come over here, and that's the K right here, the potassium has been put into solution, meaning that the potassium is migrating and moving around maybe in some groundwater uh, processes, river process, and so forth. So the pot potassium becomes a free ion. And then again, the granite or the orthoclase is reduced down to just a clay, which is a lot weaker than the, than the granite rock itself. What's interesting about the potassium in solution is that if you ever grow plants and you buy fertilizer for the plants, or sometimes they call it plant food, uh, you find that one of the main ingredients in plant food, plant food is potassium. And here on earth, by just weathering some granite, you can actually produce or nature can produce natural fertilizer for plants. So really in essence, a rock, especially a granite containing feldspar, can uh, release the potassium and provide food for the plant. So this is a very, very uh, important reaction. It's a very, very common reaction uh, that's found uh, on the Earth's surface. And so for exam purposes, uh, I need to have every student memorize this entire chemical reaction. So right now your eyes are rolling, you're going, what? No, of course not. Really what we need to learn is that from this reaction, we can take orthoclase, which is a very hard mineral, scratches glass, and the orthoclase mineral is decomposed chemically to kaolinite clay. And that's how we want to look at this particular reaction. So let me repeat that one more time. Orthoclase, being a very hard mineral, scratches glass, chemically decomposes into a kaolinite clay. And that's really what we want to take home from this, um, from this uh, reaction. At the bottom part of your screen is a great example of what granite looks like after it's been chemically altered and chemically weathered uh, for an extensive amount of geologic time. And so here you have your granite at the, at the upper bottom part of the picture. And below is a hand showing where the granite basically is decomposed into nothing but granules and grains. And that's really what happens. If you can, if nature can decompose the little orthoclase mineral that kind of binds the granite together, the granite will just disintegrate and turn into smaller pieces and little granules. The term that is used to describe this process is called granular disintegration. And so typically older, older granite, especially in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains, are undergoing or have gone under granular disintegration. And you can really walk up to some older granites and basically rub your hand across them and it'll just disintegrate in your hand. And that's most in part due 
uh, to orthoclase um, converting into kaolinite clay. This slide here now looks at if we take some original material, which would be on the left-hand side of the arrow, and we weather it through carbonic acid or through the similar uh, process we talked about in the, in the previous slide, we come up with a weathering product. And really what I want you to know is that on the weathering product side, if what is the most, what is the common material that you see on the side of the weathering product? And hopefully folks are saying, well, I see clay. Clay, clay, clay. And what I'm trying to illustrate in this diagram is that once the rock has decomposed chemically into a clay material, it basically is at the end of its weathering chemical cycle. In other words, the most reduced product that can be, be produced from a rock, for example, chemically, is clay. So let me re-emphasize that. Clay is the most reduced product. So coming over to the original material, you see iron bearing silicates, and it gives you a whole list of different minerals that are iron bearing. And if we apply, chemi if we apply chemical weathering uh, to those minerals, it turns into iron oxide clay minerals, which is actually a highly rich reddish type clay. Where it says feldspar, uh, that is the example we used in the previous slide. And so again, clay minerals, that would be the kaolinite clay in this case. And you can see where um, potassium uh, now becomes an ion. What's very interesting is looking at quartz. If you allow quartz <clears throat> to be chemically weathered and allow carbonic acid to attack quartz over geologic time, what happens to the quartz on the other side of the weathering product? It becomes quartz. Quartz is tough. Quartz is tenacious. You can't get rid of that stuff. Um, and there's reasons for that. One reason is the fact that quartz is dominantly made out of the uh, silica tetrahedron. And what did you learn about that uh, when you were uh, looking at minerals? It's a very, very, very strong, strong, covalently uh, bonded molecule. So you can't get rid of quartz. And again, you go down, if you look back at the original mineral list and go down to muscovite, again, clay minerals, calcite, and more ions. So again, I can overemphasize that the most reduced chemical product of a rock is known as a clay.